Jill Hubick, your lung nurse here, coming to you from Lung, Saskatchewan. This is Lung Lessons, connecting you with experts in health with lung lessons and tips to keep you well. You know every breath starts with an inspiration, so let's get inspired. I'm hosting this podcast on Treaty 6 territory, the ancestral and traditional territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, Lakota Sioux, as well as the territory of the Métis. Today's expert is Dr. Alexander Wong, a doctor specializing in infectious disease and research with the Saskatchewan Health Authority in the Department of Medicine at the University of Saskatchewan. Dr. Wong's clinical practice is based at the Infectious Disease Clinic at the Regina General Hospital. Today, RSV, a common lung infection. Thanks so much for joining us today, Dr. Wong. Thanks so much, Jill. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, we are so excited to have you. And before we get into talking about RSV and and the content today, I want to first help our listeners understand a little bit more about you and the area you work in and tell us why you chose to work in the area of infectious disease, because that's very specific. Sure, Jill. So, uh, you know, I finished my medical school in 2005 in London, Ontario at Western University. And uh, then I subsequently came out west, did my internal medicine and my infectious diseases in Edmonton at the University of Alberta. I was really drawn to infectious diseases because uh, there's a component of social justice kind of, uh, you know, involved with a lot of infectious disease related work. Uh, We know that infectious disease in general uh, disproportionately affects those who are less advantaged, those who are marginalized, those who are vulnerable. So a lot of the day-to-day work that I do, sort of like with chronic viral infections, things like HIV and viral hepatitis, hepatitis C, for example, you know, uh, disproportionately affect those uh, populations. Um, And I have a bit of a, a soft spot for those populations and wanting to support and advocate for those populations who often struggle or don't necessarily have the means to be able to effectively advocate for themselves. Um, So that's a huge part of it, but obviously infectious disease is very broad. There's a lot of infectious diseases. Um, RSV is one of them. Uh, Some of you may have heard me like when I was a little bit more uh, uh, visible with the COVID stuff. Uh, I, I kind of have stepped away from some of that just mostly because I have so many other things that kind of needed to be done and it was taking so much time and so much energy, but, uh, you know, it was a great learning experience. So it's, it's great to be able to continue to engage and to teach and to educate and to advocate. That's a huge part of what I want to do day to day. Mm, Just listening to you talk, I can hear your compassion and your empathy for the people that you help. And we're so lucky here in Saskatchewan to have you not only take care of those that aren't well, but also, you know, prevent illness to protect us. So thank you for all you do. And yes, absolutely. You were very visible during the pandemic, uh, the height of the pandemic, I should say, uh, with COVID-19. And you did an amazing job at taking complicated information and you put it in a way on radio and on TV to make it so we could really, really understand what was going on and how to best take precautions and care for ourselves. So thank you for that. And now you're on the Lung Lessons show talking about RSV. So can you tell me a little bit more about why it's so important for you to do that, to empower and inform people about lung health and how to just take care of their overall health and wellness? Thanks for like all the kind words. It's a little bit, uh, kind of a little bit flushed here, just embarrassed just how nice you were. But, uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, there's so much information that gets thrown us at all, all the time. And it's getting progressively more and more confusing sometimes to try to sort of understand it all because there's just so much coming at us at, at at all times in different mediums from, you know, kind of traditional TV, radio, and now there's all sorts of stuff on social media. Um, so trying to understand all of that and make sense of it, and most importantly, like try to make good medical decisions is is very complicated at times and can be pretty intimidating. 
So, you know, trying to just, uh, you know, provide some simplicity and to focus on some key messages, uh, I think is important and to try to simplify also respecting the fact that these are complex topics. There's a lot of complexity always associated. But in these sorts of situations, you know, when we're going to be talking mostly about like how can we prevent people from getting seriously ill as a result of RSV, um, you know, it's kind of like with COVID, um, you know, vaccination just made sense for practically everyone for many, many different reasons at an individual level and at a societal level. Kind of feel the same way about RSV and other vaccines. Uh, uh, so we're going to get into that shortly and hopefully give your audience an opportunity to, you know, feel more comfortable about moving forward, about preventing RSV for themselves and for their family members, if that's something that they're thinking about doing. Mm, and that makes such good sense because you're right. With technology and the internet and social media, we have so much at our fingertips, but sometimes that can be overwhelming. And sometimes the information that we're seeing or hearing or reading about isn't scientific or accurate. So it's great to be able to talk to you today, a lung expert, uh, an expert in health, uh, to help clarify and simplify some of this information. So let's get right into it and start at the beginning. Some people may not even know what RSV is. So what does RSV stand for? So RSV stands for uh, respiratory syncytial virus. Uh, you know, we're just going to use RSV kind of going forward. It's a very common viral infection uh, that causes basically seasonal outbreaks of upper respiratory and lower respiratory tract viral illnesses throughout the entire world. Um, here in North America, uh, so so outbreaks are always very seasonal, but here in North America, we're just going to kind of focus on the North American, the Canadian, uh, North American context. Uh, outbreaks usually occur starting around kind of like October and November, and they kind of go through until about April and May, and they usually peak kind of, you know, in the January, February months. Um, so this is important to know because the timing of like vaccine and stuff is important. We'll get into that a little later on. Um, so it can cause basically what amounts to like a cold um, and related sort of symptoms in people of all ages. And it's super, super common, uh, especially in kids. And by the time kids like hit age two, like almost all kids have had at least one episode of RSV. Usually they acquire RSV like from older in, uh, older individuals in the house, like or older sort of siblings in the house as well. Um, our bodies don't do a great job of protecting us like from RSV reinfection like forever. There are some types of infections where, you know, when we recover from them, we'll develop like lifelong sort of protection. Um, and it'll be very unlikely that we're going to get infected again. RSV is not one of those things. But usually uh, the, the first episode of RSV that occurs in like early childhood, usually the primary episode you know, is is the most serious one. And, you know, young infants uh, under the age of two are our greatest risk of having more severe complications and, and, and related illness where upper respiratory stuff can go down into the lungs and cause things like pneumonia and respiratory failure and things of that sort. Um, so we're not probably going to talk a ton about it in infants and in the child, uh, in, 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 in the sort of younger sort of population. But in the end, um, you know, that's where it's going to be most common. And then from there, we sort of get reinfected throughout our lives, basically on a repeated basis, sort of over and over and over again. Those attacks usually are less severe. Um, and most of us will usually recover without any significant consequence. But of course, like with all viruses, um, you know, if you have other sort of pre-existing medical issues or complications, or if your immune system doesn't work as well, either because you're on medications that suppress your immune system, or because you have medical conditions that may potentially lead your immune system to not work quite the same as everybody else's, then you can be at higher risk of having complications. Um, and again, we'll get into all that, I think, uh, in a little bit here. Wow. Okay. Thank you. That you, you talked about a lot there. Uh, one of the things that I found very shocking and surprised me, you said by the age of two, most people will have been infected by RSV, yep. and that's where it can we typically see it being very serious. Um, mm -hmm. Is that partly because 
they ha- don't have as an immune system that maybe has been exposed to something like this before. So it's the first time their little bodies have experienced that. Is it also because they have smaller airways? Why, when they're younger, do we see more of a severe reaction or outcome? Yeah, it's a combination of both. Um, again, I'm not a pediatric expert, but uh, again, in general, uh, you know, the first episode when we when we have no sort of pre-existing immunity, uh, you know, humoral or cellular immunity against the virus, uh, you know, uh, and so we've always kind of thought, I think historically, me as an adult infectious disease physician, I always kind of thought about RSV up until like the last couple of years as largely like a kid problem and an infant problem. We know we've heard, again, stories like immediately kind of post COVID in kind of 2022 about how RSV was like driving huge amounts of illness and like filling up our ICUs here in Saskatchewan, our pediatric ICUs here in Saskatchewan around the country. And it, it's because A, uh, it happens so commonly uh, in kids. And so even though for the vast majority of kids, that illness is going to be relatively mild when you have so many kids getting infected, a small proportion of those kids or kids that have, again, like pre-existing medical conditions or other complications that could put them at higher risk of having complications of RSV, that's when it can kind of progress down into the lower airways. It can kind of block the airways. um, And then you can, again, develop more serious complications like pneumonia, as opposed to the typical sort of bronchiolitis that we see where most infants just kind of, uh, you know, they, they, they can recover essentially on their own without needing to be hospitalized. To be clear, um, essentially what happens is, is that you get severe, you get hospitalizations that occur, you know, sort of before the age of two, because there's so many kids early in childhood who get infected. And then basically for the most part, like throughout middle age, like when you basically sort of go, uh, over the age of two, all the way through to like into your 50s and 60s, the likelihood of you, again, like being hospitalized as a result of RSV is low, not zero. Um, But then obviously, as you get older, you accumulate medical comorbidities, you're definitely at higher risk of having complications as a result of RSV, similar to other viruses like COVID, like flu, for example. Um, And that's why prevention is so important, especially in our older populations. Hmm. Okay. So you unpacked a lot there. You talked about people that are very young and then the older population as well. So that's a really big group, right? And then, Mm -hmm. of course, as we have an aging population, that's a lot of people for us to think about. So Mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about how we can help that very large group. Uh, One of my favorite quotes when it comes to health and wellness, uh, being a nurse myself, I always think of what Benjamin Franklin once said, that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So tell me, what are your top lung lesson tips to prevent RSV? So before we just jump right into vaccines, like I think it's important to remember just kind of how RSV is transmitted. Uh, you know, it's similar to a lot of other sort of viral infections like COVID. Um, so transmission is typically direct contact. Um, and so we know that the virus can sort of exist, you know, on inanimate sort of what we call fomites for, you know, a period of several hours. And so again, I mean, if you're not kind of practicing good hand hygiene, you touch something and then you inoculate like in your nose or like, uh, your eyes or so forth, you know, that's the most common way that the virus spreads. And so, you know, I think going back to the first principles that we talked about so much at the beginning and throughout most of the pandemic, we talked about uh, the importance of hand hygiene, you know, we that, which is it's still really, really, really important, obviously. And so trying to wash your hands, use hand sanitizer, you know, I, I, again, I mean, you don't have to necessarily be obsessive about it, but uh, the other important piece is really trying hard not to touch your face, not to touch your nose, your eyes, 
you know, uh, things of that sort, because it's got to get from your hands to the mucous membranes to then sort of, uh, you know, get into your respiratory epithelium and start to, to replicate. So that's kind of how the most likely sort of uh, spread occurs. However, it can also be spread by sort of large droplet aerosols by someone that's coughing sort of directly sort of, you know, in your immediate vicinity, for example. So, you know, again, I, I, masking is kind of obviously like not really as much of a thing anymore as it once was. But if you're someone that has significant medical comorbidities, you have like a lot of pre-existing sort of lung or heart-related issues, you're out and about, I think it's entirely reasonable to look at using a mask, um, not only because it helps to protect you from those large droplets that someone might just cough directly into your face, but it also it helps like with like especially if you're someone that likes to kind of i don't know like touch your touch your face a lot um you know just putting a mask on you know and kind of covering up helps to reduce the likelihood that you're going to accidentally inoculate yourself um you know if you've touched yourself and you haven't necessarily uh, practiced good hand hygiene so hand hygiene and masking is still very very important these are simple practical things that you can do you can make individual decisions for yourself and especially if you're at higher risk of, you know, having more complicated viral illness, you have underlying medical comorbidities, you have a lot underlying immuno uh, uh, suppression or immunocompromised for whatever reason, or you're just older in general. Those are all things that make a lot of sense, right? And I mean, those are decisions we can all make for ourselves to be able to uh, protect ourselves. We're not again, engaging with others and trying to advocate like at a societal level now, these are really individual level decisions. So those are some really basic first principles that I think are applicable not only to RSV, but obviously to all respiratory viruses. And this remains like super important to do. Um, then of course we have vaccines and uh, you know we can talk a little bit more about the vaccines, but I think this is part of why RSV has gotten a little bit more attention certainly last season you know kind of going into you know kind of the fall uh because we had an rsv vaccine that was approved here in canada for use we now have two vaccines that are approved for use in older adults over the age of 60. Um, so we'll be able to talk about that more um, but that's definitely an option that people can look at to provide even more robust protection uh, against both getting rsv but more importantly if you get rsv significantly reducing the likelihood that you're going to have complications with that, you know, severe illness, hospitalization, and obviously death. Hmm. Okay. So going back to the basics, hand washing, key. Mm -hmm. Yep. Making sure we try not to touch our face. And some of us might not even realize we're doing it half the time, but if we wash I our hands, that helps. Face. I just touched my face, you know, just, I, I didn't do this during the pandemic and yeah. Here I am just touching myself again. So, you know, I mean, this is just part of how it is now. Yeah, some of it's just our natural tendencies. So try not to touch our face. But if we've washed our hands, that's going to help us. Uh, and then, like you said, you know, really know yourself and know how at risk you are and consider masking if that's right for you or if you're in a, yep. a, a very in public, public space space or, uh, you know, an enclosed space where there isn't as great of ventilation, all those things. And it won't just protect you from RSV, but other respiratory 100%. illnesses that like to float around this time of year. For sure. Okay, awesome. And then you mentioned now that we have two RSV vaccines. Yep. So we can go into them. Um, so there's two products. Uh, I'm going to avoid using trade names, but I'll just mention them both. So the first one that was approved uh, is uh, manufactured by uh, GSK, GlaxoSmithKline. They're obviously a big pharmaceutical company. The trade name for the product is Arexv. Um, it was the first one approved uh, for the first RSV season last year, uh, last fall, basically here in Canada. Um, so that one's obviously available. Some people that are, are listening may have actually received a dose already or received a dose last season. We can talk a little bit more about some of those details and kind of some of the data around that product. There is another product now manufactured by another company. It's called uh, it's called Abrisvo. It's manufactured by Pfizer, also obviously a large pharmaceutical company. Uh, and Abrisvo was uh, approved by Health Canada earlier this year, so it is now going to be available uh, for this fall's RSV season. 
Um, a brisvo is a little bit different because it has the older adult indication, like for all adults over the age of 60, um, but it also has an indication in uh, 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 the maternal setting to potentially prevent uh, severe RSV in newborn infants between the ages of zero and six months as well. We're probably not going to go into great detail, I'm guessing, with that one, uh, with that indication specifically. I can talk a bit more about it, um, but that's what makes the Pfizer product a little bit unique uh, is the dual indication. Uh, and yeah, we can go into the details about uh, the GSK product and the Pfizer product uh, uh, pretty shortly here. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. And I think it's exciting that there's options and maybe one product might be recommended more so for a different group or a different individual. Um, okay, so generally speaking, let's start with uh, the first vaccine that came out from GSK. Um, who should get it? So I'll just refer to it as the GSK product mm -hmm. uh, or XV. I'm just going to call it the GSK product. So so uh, the data basically around the, the, the GSK vaccine was published in 2023, looking at essentially the efficacy of the vaccine uh, against sort of uh, respiratory tract illness, secondary to RSV and severe, and they had definitions of what severe or uh, lower respiratory tract illness was against RSV. And they saw, you know, protection of about like 80% against symptomatic RSV disease after one season and uh, pretty high, like 94, 95% against severe RSV associated lower respiratory tract disease uh, after the first season as well. They did follow all those patients through a second season. Um, efficacy in the second season for symptomatic RSV uh, illness uh, did drop, so to about like 55, 60%. Um, but that was still deemed to be like reasonable protection. And in that trial, there was a, an arm where basically people that got vaccinated in the first season, there was a subset of those individuals who actually received a second dose of vaccine after the first season, and then they were followed. Um, so essentially you have three groups in that trial, one group that received like nothing and were followed, one group that received one dose at the very start, and then a, a third group that received two doses, one at the beginning of the study and one after season one to try to get a sense of whether or not a second dose would be helpful or not. So far, the data that we have, and the, all of those patients are going to be followed through three seasons in total, um, the data would suggest at this point that the second dose given after the first season was not necessarily helpful in preventing additional illness or didn't seem to have any significant additional benefit. So right now, the indication is basically for one dose, there appears to be solid protection through two seasons, and there's no uh, indication at this point for like a, a revaccination or a booster dose. It's not clear what that's going to look like kind of going forward. The GSK product does contain what's called an adjuvant. So an adjuvant is like a uh, like a, a immune, an immunostimulatory sort of compound that sort of like revs up our immune system um, and and leads to a more vigorous kind of immune response. So that in theory we have more protection, uh, you know, sort of triggered through the antibody. And there is no live virus. Uh, this is a recombinant uh, component of RSV uh, antibody that's driving this response. So it's not a live virus vaccine. Um, the adjuvant does lead the GSK product to to have some uh, to have some side effects. So it's very very common to get some injection site tenderness after you've received a dose of vaccine, or to have like a little bit of like aches and pains or headache things of this sort. Um, those of you that have received shingles vaccine um, or the so-called Shingrix, which is also manufactured by the same company, the adjuvant material is the same. Um, and so, you know, we know that the shingles vaccine is also quite immunostimulatory and can cause like those types of reactions. Those are all generally mild to moderate things that can be resolved just with like some Tylenol or ibuprofen and will go away within a day or two. So that's kind of like the GSK product. Uh, I'll talk really quickly about the Pfizer product as well. So the Abrisvo, I'll just call it the Pfizer vaccine. So it is also now approved by Health Canada for uh, all individuals over the age of 60. Uh, and uh, again, it uh, basically published phase three clinical trial data in uh, mid-2023 as well. Um, and again, the challenge with comparing the studies is that uh, the GSK study 
and the Pfizer study sort of had like different definitions of what they were using when they were measuring like uh, outcomes in their studies. So it's not simple or really even practical to somehow try to compare like the two vaccines against one another because the definitions that were used in the clinical trials were quite different. So for the Pfizer study, they looked at sort of uh, uh, RSV associated lower respiratory tract disease with two or more symptoms and with three or more symptoms. The idea being that two or more symptoms is sort of like a lower uh, bar and then three or more symptoms is a slightly higher bar after one season. And they were done, the studies were done basically at the same time. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine showed about like 65, 70% uh, uh, protection against uh, lower respiratory tract RSV associated disease with two or more symptoms and about like 85% uh, for, with the same sort of definition, but three or more symptoms. So again, I don't want to simplify it and just say that I, I said something like 90 something percent for GSK and I said 85% something for Pfizer. Therefore, one is somehow better than the other. That's not the case. Um, the studies are different and it's basically impossible to compare them head to head. So for practical purposes, um, you know, honestly, like at this point, we would consider the vaccines largely equivalent. Uh, and when we look at some of the guidance from some of the major guideline groups, including the US with CDC and ACIP and here in Canada with NACI, they have no specific preferential recommendation for either product. Um, they basically will say, look, um, you know, you should give one dose of either. We have no preference, one versus the other. Some things that differentiate the two products, um, the Pfizer study did not have an arm which received two doses. So they basically just had one dose and then they followed like half of those individuals who received the one dose and then the other half received nothing through two seasons, that's it. So like the GSK product, there's no indication right now for the Pfizer product for any type of a booster dose. Um, and it's not clear exactly what that's gonna look like going forward. There may be some data that comes out eventually to support a booster dose of either one or the other, but that that's not clear right now. Um, and again, looking at second season data for Pfizer, it looks as though it has reasonable efficacy through two seasons as well. So both the GSK and the Pfizer vaccine basically would provide what we would consider to be like more than adequate protection against RSV associated viral illness over two seasons. Um, I'll just say really quickly, uh, Jill, that there is a third company in the mix, uh, Moderna. Uh, they have an mRNA uh, associated RSV vaccine for which their phase three data has also been published late last year in the New England. Um, so to make a long story short, I'm not gonna go into great detail with the Moderna product because it's not as yet approved here in Canada for clinical use. It might get approved soon, but I don't think that it's practically gonna be available for this RSV season probably for next season is when we're going to have it. But if you look down at our colleagues in the United States, they actually have access now to all three products, um, you know, for this RSV season. Last year, they actually had uh, access to both the Pfizer and the GSK products uh, for their uh, for the RSV season last year. And the uptake of the two vaccines, as far as I understand, was roughly similar. So the Pfizer product does not contain an adjuvant. Um, and so that's one of the differences. Um, and so the side effect profile for the Pfizer vaccine is a little bit different. It seems to be a little bit perhaps less uh, injection site reaction, less kind of aches and pains, but we do still see some of those reactions as well, which are mild to moderate. And again, can be managed symptomatically with Tylenol, Advil, those types of things. So in the end, it's a little complicated. It's not simple to compare. I would encourage people not to compare. Um, and again, we don't want to use like simple uh, uh, sort of assumptions like, oh, you know, I got Pfizer vaccine for COVID and therefore I should get Pfizer vaccine for RSV. This is not how this stuff works. So in the end, uh, you know, I think the most important thing for those uh, at risk um, is, is to go ahead and get one dose. Um, and basically everyone over the age of 60 there is some guidance from the guideline groups that we can talk about a bit more. Okay, awesome. Let's take a short breather and we'll be right back after this announcement. Today's Lung Lesson episode is powered by GSK, a science-led global healthcare company with a special purpose. To unite science, technology, and talent, 
to get ahead of disease together. With GSK's support, we are able to connect you with lung health experts to better empower you so you can take your best breath with every lung lesson, wherever you are. Thank you, GSK. You talked about these vaccines that are available. There's two, one from GSK, one from Pfizer. Mm -hmm. Both work very well. They For two seasons. Yep, protect people, and that is so cool. Two seasons, because that means one needle for two whole seasons. Yep. That's incredible. Uh, Go science, now, right? And then yeah, another great, one potentially coming on to the mix, too. Coming down the road, which looks, uh, which looks similar in terms of efficacy. Um, you know, and again, so it's going to be a little bit hard to differentiate all of these different products down the road. Let's not try to necessarily unpack that. There's no simple way to really do it. Um, uh, there is one other question that a lot of people are going to have, which is safety. Um, as far as we can tell, based on the clinical trials from GSK and Pfizer, it does not appear to be any like clear safety signal in any way, shape, or form. There were uh, 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 very, very small, like two, three cases of sort of uh, what we call Guillain-Barre syndrome that potentially occurred. And so there, there is a question around like whether or not the vaccines may potentially be associated with Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, there is a lot of post-marketing surveillance going on right now. There were, you know, uh, tens of thousands of doses that were administered in the United States. So most of the data I think is coming from there, from their first RSV season. Right now, the the, the guidance basically from the major uh, Canadian and American guideline groups is, is that there is no clear association with anything like Guillain-Barre or any sort of neurologic complications of any sort. So again, if you're 60 plus, and you know, especially if you're 75 plus, uh, you know, the older you are, the more at risk you are, of developing severe complications with RSV, or if you are 60 to 75 plus and you have medical related complications, lung issues, heart issues, uh, kidney issues, you know, diabetes, all these types of things that also puts you at higher risk, you're going to be at highest, uh, you're going to be the person that's going to most likely benefit from getting vaccinated. Okay. So it's safe. It's effective. You only need one dose for two seasons. If you're 60 and older, this vaccine's for you. If you're 60 to 75, have a medical complication, it's definitely for you. And if you're 75 and older, because you're older and our immune systems don't work as well, that's even another population that should really, really, really think about this. 100%. And the guideline group, so NACI specifically, which is our Canadian guideline group, they've made recommendations now, which were released in early August. Now, remember, NACI's guidance is, is mostly sort of, you know, in the public health space. So talking a little bit about public funding for these vaccines, it's a common question that's asked, like, are these vaccines going to potentially be publicly funded? And if so, like, what is that going to look like? So far, so what the NACI guidance basically, the Canadian guidance is like all individuals over the age of 75 should receive a dose. All individuals, uh, you know, in congregated sort of settings, 60 plus, so nursing home settings, continuing care settings, chronic care settings, uh, you know, not only thinking about, uh, you know, the individual level benefit there, but also like the, 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 the outbreak potential and the potential for more significant uh, complications to occur in those kind of higher risk settings. So what NACI has said is, is that um, ideally those groups should be targeted upfront uh, if there is going to be a publicly funded program. So far, as far as I'm aware, and I could please just be corrected, but as far as I know, like the only jurisdiction that's actually announced a publicly funded program thus far uh, in Canada has actually been Ontario. Um, they have basically, I think, said that they will provide a dose um, of RSV vaccine for free, publicly funded, uh, to individuals in continuing care settings, nursing home settings, and so forth. I also believe they've also announced like a program for individuals 75 plus, but I'm not 100% sure of that. I don't know that any other jurisdiction has announced that as of yet, but I know that there's a lot of discussions ongoing, so this piece may change in the upcoming weeks prior to this RSV season. So keep an eye out for that as well. 
and uh, you know whether or not we'll potentially have access to publicly funded vaccine. That may actually be a thing here in Saskatchewan this season, if not, you know, hopefully next season. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully they're leading the way and going to make that available to us in Saskatchewan. But just because it isn't currently publicly funded doesn't mean it's not super important for people to go ahead and get that vaccine. Yeah, and so I just want to be completely clear. So right now, like again, if it's not publicly funded, uh, you know, everyone basically has the ability to go and access, uh, you know, either the GSK product or the Pfizer product uh, through basically either a pharmacist or uh, you know a physician, nurse practitioner, other prescriber here in Saskatchewan. Um, I believe the pharmacy guidance is going to change like imminently to allow for uh, pharmacists to be able to prescribe. The Pfizer product, but they were last season able to also independently prescribe the GSK product as well. Um, you know, again, so there is a cost associated with that. Many individuals will have, you know, some form of like coverage or like spending account or some type of, you know, sort of piece that will allow them to, you know, sort of absorb some of the financial cost. And we're not trivializing the cost of the vaccine. Like the wholesale cost, I think, uh, for both products is identical. Um, I think it's on the order of about $250 wholesale. So when you look at what the markup is and, you know, the administration fee, you're probably looking at like 280 to 300 at the pharmacy. I'm not trivializing that amount of money, but at the same time, um, you know, like especially uh, for individuals who are at higher risk, and I would say all individuals over the age of 60, if you have the financial means to be able to access this product, um, then it honestly is a no-brainer because, again, if you end up with RSV this season, you have other sort of, you know, medical comorbidities, you know, getting that vaccine is going to significantly reduce your likelihood of having severe complications, just like with COVID, just like with flu. The, the, the intent and the purpose of the vaccines and, you know, we kind of, as a medical community and public health community, did ourselves a little bit of a disservice during COVID, sort of thinking about how the vaccines were potentially intended. They were never really intended to truly protect us from getting infected. The, the, the primary principle was to protect us, you know, if we got infected from getting severely ill and having severe complications. You know, I kind of said many, many times, you know, uh, in various settings, like it, it's the difference potentially between being at home, you know, with the sniffles and kind of feeling lousy for a couple of days and then getting better versus kind of like going out of the hospital in a box. So that's a little dramatic, but at the same time, I still think that principle applies. Like if we have the means to be able to access it, not trivializing the cost, but if you as an individual have the means to be able to afford that, you know, and get that additional protection. Again, in my mind, that's a no-brainer. Um, uh, you know, uh, to be able to protect yourself and to reduce to, to to reduce the likelihood of having a severe complication as a result of RSV. Mm, and I think you really emphasize the importance of how vulnerable we can be to this virus, but how our actions through protecting ourselves such as vaccination, can really change our vulnerability and keep us and those that we love around us safer. Um, that, that, came, that came through. So you said earlier in the show that there's peak seasons that you see, or mm -hmm. a peak season for RSV. You said typically we see it, you know, October, November, till April, and then it really peaks in January. So mm -hmm. knowing that... When do people go out and get this vaccine? So optimally, if you have the means to be able to do so, you would probably try and get vaccinated just before the upcoming season. Because again, we we know right now with the data that we have that the efficacy it does wane, um, you know, and it's un it's unclear as to how long, like whether or not there would be meaningful protection through a third season for GSK, for example. The Pfizer study is only following people for two years, so it doesn't look like we're gonna have like a third season's worth of data from that study. Um, so, but we know that the, 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 the protection slowly fades after you sort of receive your dose. So, you know, given the fact that you want to sort of maximize your protection, you know, through like the key pieces, the key timing of the of the year, I would probably, again, optimally suggest that you try and get vaccinated. So really looking at kind of, you know, getting flu, COVID and RSV optimally done at the same time, along with other vaccines like pneumococcal vaccine, 
is really an optimal approach, um, you know, really to really maximize your protection kind of going forward into the into the upcoming respiratory virus season. Those are great recommendations. You really specified, helped us understand, you know, what we need to do. We need to get the vaccine, when we need to get it, who should get it. We have time for one final thought. Mm -hmm. In just one or two sentences, what expert advice do you hope listeners take away from our conversation that we had today? You know, I think in the end, health is priceless. Uh, I was I was ill like earlier this year. Uh, it wasn't a viral thing or something that could be prevented, but I was pretty sick and I was in hospital for a while and it was, you know, it was not good for my family. It wasn't good for me. I was fortunate enough to make a recovery, but, you know, I might not have always been so lucky. And I, I look back on that and I think to myself, if there's anything that I could have done to prevent that, like I would have given any amount of money, any amount of anything outside of like basically my 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 wife and my kids and my family and my close friends like and their well-being i would have given just about anything else to not be in that situation so this is one of the challenges i think with preventative approaches is is that sometimes we don't necessarily know when we've kind of taken a step you know to prevent something like whether or not that's actually had any meaningful impact or outcome but if you're in that situation, like you would literally give anything to do it. So I, I, so I use that analogy just to say, like, if you're just kind of sitting on the fence about some of this stuff, like just go out and and make the right decision and optimize your protection with all the different uh, uh, preventative options that you have uh, access to. And again, specifically with regards to vaccines, you're really looking at things like uh, pneumococcal, uh, RSV, flu, and uh, uh, COVID for this upcoming season, that is really going to provide you with a suite of protection that is going to be optimal. And again, we're never really gonna always know like whether or not those steps made a difference for us, but if it does, then that's literally priceless. So, you know, so, uh, you know, I mean, there's an apathy component and then there's a cost component, but for those who are listening to the podcast, that have the means to get out and just kind of get it done, I would just like not hesitate. Again, the benefit risk ratio is so favorable for these products. If you have the means to be able to access it and to afford it, uh, you know, in the setting of those that are uh, the vaccines that are not funded, I would just go out and get it done. And again, there's no clarity as to what the public funding is going to look like. So, you know, so those of you kind of sitting on the fence, maybe thinking, well, you know, maybe I should hold off and wait for a public funded dose. Um, again, there's no clarity around that as of yet. So if you, again, have the means to be able to, uh, you know, to financially afford it, I would not hesitate to go out and get it done and get yourself like optimally protected for this upcoming RSV season. That's great advice. And I'm so sorry to hear that you were unwell, but thrilled to see that you are doing better, that you're here with us today because you have a lot of people to take care of, and we're so grateful uh, that you took the time to be on the show, and that was great advice. Health is priceless. I think back when I was younger, my grandma used to say to me, Jill, there's nothing more important than your health, and I don't think I appreciated it so much when I was younger than I do now that I'm older. I won't share how old I am, but now that I'm older. So thank you for that. If you're sitting on the fence, Go out and get that vaccine, that RSV vaccine. Uh, Dr. Wong also mentioned some others to consider this fall, pneumonia, flu, and COVID vaccines as well. Those will all help to protect you, prevent serious illness, keep you well, keep you breathing a little bit easier. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong, for being on the show today. Today's lung lesson RSV and you. RSV is common, but potentially very serious. Luckily, new vaccines made available to older adults have been proven to be very safe and effective, not only protecting us from serious outcomes such as pneumonia, hospitalization, and death, but also from getting the virus altogether. To review, Dr. Wong's top lung lesson tips today were protect yourself by washing your hands, avoid touching your face, consider wearing a mask, and get your RSV vaccine because in Dr. Wong's words, health is priceless. 
Next up, episode two of the Lung Lessons podcast will be aired on Valentine's Day. This February 14th, we want you thinking not just about your love life, but rather about your lung life. Take in a lesson on tips on how to protect your lungs from lung specialist and researcher, Dr. Samir Gupta. Lung Saskatchewan is also proud to bring you the Lung Life webinar series live and on demand. Learn from more experts on a variety of lung health related topics to help you live your best lung life. Find out more at lungsask.ca. And if you have a question for a lung expert, We want to hear from you. Send it in. Tell us what you want to know, and we'll get it on the upcoming shows. Send it to info at lungsask.ca. Just as every breath starts with an inspiration, it also ends with an expiration. I'm Jill Hubick, your lung nurse from Lung Saskatchewan. I hope today's tips from our lung health expert have empowered you to learn how to take your best breath. Every lung lesson is available to you on demand, so you can listen anywhere, anytime on Spotify and YouTube. Check us out while you're on the go and wherever you're breathing life in. Tune in to our lung lessons at lungsask.ca. Produced at Sound Lounge by T-Bone.